looked up to, really smart intellectual guy that just had a passion for the Lord. He said when he was 18, he was getting ready to go out and preach, being sent out to preach all over the United States and everything. And he was so stoked. He went out and bought a Schofield Bible and and then he brought it to his pastor and he's like, look, look at my new Bible. I saved up for this Bible and everything. The, the pastor looked at it, looked at the side where it says Schofield and he ripped it in half. He's like, here you go. <laughs> but you have to kind of know the background really to get that joke. But anyways, not too many people know. So anyways, we're going to take up our tithes and offerings at this time. So if I can get the ushers to come forward and we're going to stand up. It's our custom here at Hope for the Nations to stand up and we have a declaration. We declare um, out loud. We'll read this together and then we can pray and give and bless our children as they go to children's church. So, so let's stand this morning if you're able to and read. As I give in today's offering, I honor you, Lord, with the first part of my income and with all you put into my hands. All I have and all I possess is already yours. You are the giver of all good things, and therefore I give to you my first and my best. I hold nothing back. I give my tithe willful, willingly and joyfully. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us. We thank you for all the blessings that you continually bring into our life, Lord. We thank you that even in the, in the times that, that, that uh, things seem to be a little bit of lean and kind of a struggle, that you're th still there to provide for us, Lord. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the fat times and for the leaning times, Lord, because you're always there growing us, developing us, strengthening us, and bringing us to a new level of faith and a new level of holiness as we draw closer to you, Lord. We pray right now that you would bless our children as they're released to Children's Church, that they would learn your word, that it would go down deep into their hearts, God, that they'd be able to fall back on it. But I pray most of all, Lord, that they would experience your presence and hear your voice, Holy Spirit, so that they would be led by you throughout their days and throughout their journeys in life with you, Lord. We pray blessing over them. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Children, you're able to, to go now. We're continuing on in our Fruit of the Spirit series, Experience Freedom. We're almost done. How many people have been liking it? Amen. Amen. It's been fun, huh? Pastor Frank shared on, on faithfulness, on being faithful. How many enjoyed that word? It was a really, really good word. I think almost everyone came forward to get some prayer and just refocus and and really kind of reignite that faith and that passion inside of us. If you weren't able to get that, it should be online. We got things going. So I think we downloaded about four sermons that have been backed up this past week. Um, so but we're going to be talking about meekness this morning. King James Version uses meekness. And, uh, later translations um, use gentleness. So that's what we're going to be talking and, and dealing with this morning. So let's go in our Bibles. Um, uh, Matthew. The book of Matthew, we're going to be reading a couple references there, and it's going to be chapter 11. We're going to be reading Matthew 11, 28 through 30, and Matthew 5, 5, and it'll be up on the screen if, if you happened to forget your Bible, which we encourage you to bring your Bible. We do have scriptures up on the screen, but it's always good just to see inside your Bible. You can mark it up just like Tyler's grandpa. I have a bunch of stuff right here. I don't really know what, what that means or anything. It just, I just do it just to make it look like if I'm sitting next to someone, they see the highlight and it'd be like, Oh, he knows how to study. You know? So if you, if you really don't know, and you're just like, there's no marks in your Bible, just go ahead and mark it. I got a lot of feedback. And then someone next to you will think you're spiritual. That's, that's all that's for really just joking. Just joking. A lot of tears, a lot of wet stains going on in Bibles and everything like that. It's good. It's good stuff. Amen. We love our Bible. Amen? Amen? We love the Bible. We love the Word of God. We love, especially when the Spirit of the Lord breathes upon it and speaks directly to us in our hearts to change us into who He created us to be. Praise the Lord. Let's go, and we're going to read now, Matthew eleven, twenty-eight 28 through 30. It says, this is Jesus speaking. It's in red in my Bible. It says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount. 
the Beatitudes with Matthew 5, verse 5. Again, it's read, it's Jesus speaking, and it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that's taken place, the testimony from the Waddingtons being able to just experience your generational blessing upon their household, Lord, and on their lineage. We thank you for coming before you this morning in worship and being able to lift up our hands, Lord. So often it's so hard for us to, to lift up our hands because we see ourselves in our degradation and our own sin, but we know that you've come to bring life and life more abundantly and to speak life where there once was death. So we thank you, Lord, that you can, you can speak life into our lives as we lift our hands and surrender unto you, God. We thank you for our children. We pray for blessing to be upon them, that you would use us and others around us, godly people, to just encourage and bring truth and bring life and bring light into their lives, Lord, knowing that the days are getting darker. We also pray, God, that you would just use me this morning to be able to speak what you, you want to share into our hearts and into this atmosphere and into our culture of our church, Lord, so that we truly would be a meek church and gentle. We thank you and praise you, Lord. Please teach us as you have called us to come close to you and learn from you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking about gentleness and meekness this morning. It is the eighth attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. And, and normally in our day and age, when you kind of hear that word, you think, oh man, that is boring, right? Like meekness, gentleness, that's not what we want, right? I mean, you think of, a, it, it, you think of someone, especially guys, it's like, I don't want to hang out with someone that's meek. If that's the description you have, it, he's like, he's meek. Oh, okay, well, I'm not inviting him over to the game, the Seahawks game afterwards. And he's definitely not coming to the UFC fight Friday night, right? 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 I mean, come on, it's like, okay, meek, uh, that's kind of weird. I mean, especially women, you're not really, I mean, I don't think that was, you know, the top five category or just characteristic of a guy that you were writing down since you were a young girl to be able to be like, you know, I want a meek guy. It's like, no, you want someone that's a protector, someone that, that, that keeps you safe, not, not someone that you might be able to beat in arm wrestling, you know, I mean, or if you are that, you know, okay, whatever, but don't tell me, I don't need to know. But we kind of, when we hear the word meek and, and have grew up hearing meek or gentle in the Bible, it's like, man, you know, I read the Old Testament, it's awesome, and it's, you know, just like warriors and all this kind of stuff, and, and we think, you know what, I don't, you, when we think of Jesus, or we think of, of, of uh, Moses, or we think of King David, that's not really the first, per, first thing that we think of is meek. And it's usually because we don't really know the true understanding. I know that as I was studying this, it was really difficult because, you know, you try and look in the English dictionary and all it is is just kind of, you know, lethargic or um, doesn't have a spine, doesn't, you know, they, they just don't stick up for themselves. But, but as we go into the Bible and see what it actually means to be meek is totally different. And there's something that I think is very valuable, right, that we need to learn and we need to grasp, and that is, the one thing is, is the word. Let me first tell you what the word is for the Greek word for either meekness or gentleness in the Bible. And I was listening on Blue Letter Bible to hear how you actually say this word. But it's praates. It comes from the word praos. So praates is P-R-A-O-T-E-S. And I believe it's, it's uh, G4256. Maybe. So, so biblical meekness refers to exercising God's strength under his control. Let me read that again. Biblical meekness refers to exercising God's strength under his control. It's having a spirit of willingness and obedience. It's demonstrating power with undue harshness. I know for many of us, when we think of meekness or we think of gentleness, we're like, I knew this Christian life is going to be stuffy. It's all about cardigans, turtleneck sweaters, and all that kind of stuff, right? But it's truly demonstrating God's power, God's strength under control. That it's being able to come under his rule and under his reign, but being used for purpose and being used for greatness. And I know usually when we, when we think of it, there's another word, there's another term that's used um, for this word praates. And instead of gentleness or meekness, and that is tame or broken. I know for many of us here, many know that before you can get a wild horse or a wild stallion or a wild animal and be able to use it um, readily 
for yourself, that it needs to be tame, it needs to be broken. And so the same idea is here for the word meek and for the word gentle, that there's a taming going on of a wild animal or of an individual, because usually when there's a wild animal, it causes destruction, right? It causes chaos. It just isn't able to hold it all together. But when an uh, animal is tamed and when it's, when it's broken, that it's used it's, it's useful for the masculine, but it's also being able to kind of being harnessed that energy to be used for its full potential. And that's what we want to hear and, and learn from this morning on the topic of meekness is being able to know how to harness all the energy, all the power that God has given us through his spirit so that we can truly use it instead of being like wild beasts going out and just doing whatever we want. Right. And we see it all throughout the world because that's what the culture is talking about. It's all about me and mine. It's all about myself. It's all about looking out for number one, right? I mean, you go and try and get a job and it's all about self-promotion. This is what I can do. This is all I have. This is all that I've done. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And if you're really good at self-promotion or evangelizing self, you're going to get the job more than anybody else. That's the culture we live in, right? I mean, I don't know if anybody has ever seen Joe versus the volcano. One of my favorites, cult classic Joe versus volcano. If you haven't seen Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan, it's an amazing, but the opening scene is is Mr. Waturi. He's kind of the boss in this crazy fluorescent lighted office. And the whole time during this opening scene, he's on the phone being like, I know he can get the job, but can he do the job? I know he can get the job, but can he do the job? That's not the question. I know he can get the job, but can he do the job? And so you just hear this is in the background the whole time. And we've created a culture of just being able to get the job, but not actually do the job. And it's come sometimes as, as flown in and, and migrated into even our Christian walk. We can get the job. We've said this initial prayer, but can we do the job? Can we live the life of a believer? Can we truly walk in power? Can we truly be meek and gentle and demonstrate God's love to other people around us? Or are we so focused on ourselves that we go back and just kind of get in our car? I've, I've used the illustration before. We kind of come safely into church, come inside this four wall building. And then as soon as the service is out, we get in our car, go back, drive into our, our garage that's now attached. And so we don't have to go to the outside. Or are we able to demonstrate God's gentleness, God's love, and God's meekness to people around us? Because when we are able to truly walk in meekness and walk in gentleness, it's God's power under control. And he's able to throw it and pour it into our lives so that it can be demonstrated in the world around us. Amen? Because that's what he calls us. He calls to be the light of the world. That we're to be a church body, his body, to be able to bring hope and healing to people around us and into the world. And so that's what, that's what we see, though, is, is in the culture that we live in, just like professional athletes. Every, I mean, football is going on right now. They only have 16 games, um, normal season. But every week they have to go out and they have to prove themselves. And if they don't, they lose their starting position. If they fail, do something dumb that's going to be on ESPN. People are going to be talking about it. People are going to be criticizing it. Just having that, I mean, even in our jobs and our careers, right? We have to continuously prove ourselves. But here is this promise that Jesus is giving to us that you can find rest for your souls. And in this world, there is no rest because we're always having to prove ourselves. And even sometimes inside of a church and inside that culture of religiosity, it's always trying to outdo the person that's sitting in the pew next to you. It's always trying to prove myself that I am a Christian. But God is trying to promise that there is finding rest in our souls. As we come and enter into that peace and enter into that rest of coming near to him. Amen. So this question I have right here is, are we giving room to cultivate the Christ likeness that the spirit is trying to produce in us? Are we giving over control of the gardens of our lives to the working of the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of the spirit in us? I know it's very difficult when you grow up in this day and age and you're trying to prove yourself. You're trying to um, make a name for yourself in business. And I'm not trying to say, you know, go ahead and sit back at your job or your career. Go ahead, you know, and just be lethargic, be, be limp, do whatever. But know that we need to be good stewards with God has given to us. Amen. That we need to be able to, to be used, to be a witness to others in demonstration, not only in word, but in deed, in our action. And that's how, how good we work. And just our, our work ethics. But God is, is trying to instill in us. And I believe that through this, this meekness. That he's showing us that there is a, a place of rest. Where we don't have to worry about the daily struggles and daily lives. Because he's drawing us close to him. 
So this first thing we see in this text in Matthew 11 is developing uh, or cultivating meekness or gentleness is that Jesus invites us to come near to him. Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites us with a promise of rest, but first we must go to him. First he calls us to come to him. So there's a, there's a calling. So that means we have to go to him, that we have to leave the place that we're at and actually get up and go to him. That means of not staying where we're at, in that same mentality, in that same lifestyle, but he's calling us to go near to him. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, which I read just one scripture, it says in verse 5, it says, Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What sometimes we fail to see about this, we kind of just look at these verses sometimes um, in the Beatitudes and think, oh, this is just one, okay, I can work on that, okay, I'll be meek. You can't just wake up one morning and just think, okay, I'm going to be meek. I'm just going to live in meekness. It's, it's actually a development. There's actually stages of a journey or a process that is taking place in this Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes. And first we see where it takes place is Matthew 5.1. So this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, and seeing the multitudes, Jesus. We're talking about uh, cultivating the spiritual fruit. Amen. So Matthew 5, 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So we see that the first thing that is needed, that we need to go to him. He's calling us to a higher place. He's calling us to a higher place of living. A higher calling that is upon our life, but you can't receive, and you can't walk in that higher calling unless you follow him. You go up to the mountain, and you meet with him. About leaving the degradation, and leaving the mindset, and leaving the mentality of lack, of deficiency, of just, of, of, of negativity. We can't walk in a higher calling, and in the purpose of God, when we maintain the mindset of negativity. That God is wanting us to bring us up to a new level of thinking, of a new mentality, to where we can sit next to him. He saw the multitude. That was the first thing he did. Many times we see Jesus, when he sees the multitude, he had compassion on him. It doesn't say this. First, he sees the multitude, and what does he do? He leaves them. And he goes up on the mountain, instead of actually going to them and healing him. Because God is calling us as believers to be leaders. He's calling us to be disciples because he wants to use us. So that we would have that same heart of compassion to bring healing and restoration into people's lives. So the first thing he does, he invites us to come up, to come near. And then in verse 2 it says, then he opened his mouth and taught them. Saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So knowing the first, the first thing is going up and coming to him, coming close to him. But in the actual Beatitudes, when he's talking to them, first thing there needs to be noticing is there is a poor in spirit. That we in and above ourselves are spiritually bankrupt. That I am deficient. That I cannot do this life on my own and I need a savior. I need someone to save me. I've been messing my life up this whole life, this whole life that I've had, and I need someone that can get me out, and I am poor and I am deficient. So the first thing there needs to do to take place is seeing the deficiency, seeing the need in myself before I can draw, as I draw close to him. That I've been so laden down and I've been so burdened with life, and now it's drawing close to him and seeing just the emptiness that is inside of me. Next, we see that there's a stage of mourning. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Just like a stage of mourning over a lost loved one, there needs to be a mourning over our past, over our sin, over the lifestyle that we once lived, because it not only hurt us, but it hurt others around us. And I'm not trying to create a culture of being morbid and always looking at myself as a sinner and, and woe is me and negative Nancy or anything like that. But there comes a time that you need to be able to mourn your own loss because there's actually a healing that takes place. Just like with a lost loved one, there needs to be a mourning process that takes place to actually move into the stage of healing and restoration inside your heart and inside your soul. So you can't, you can't experience God's comfort. You can't experience God's grace unless there is a mourning process. Because once there is a mourning over your past, over your own sins that, that have been committed against yourself and against others then it says that you will be comforted. 
We can't be useful for God. We can't live a meek lifestyle unless we've experienced the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He is the comforter, the Bible says. Unless we experience grace, we can't live a lifestyle of grace around us. Amen? If we continually, continuously look at our own sin and just stay in the mourning stage, we're going to look at other people and try and bring them into a, a lifestyle of mourning. When we're not called to a lifestyle of mourning. Amen? We're called to a lifestyle of abundant living. But there needs to be a process of a mourning stage taking place in our lives so that we can experience the comfort. I know, I know for when you, when you go to someone and, and something takes place in their lives and you try and comfort them, but it's hard for you to really comfort them because sometimes you don't have that empathy towards them. Empathy is knowing, experiencing the same thing that they've went through and you can kind of be there with someone. When we go through that mourning process, it brings a level of empathy because maybe I didn't have the same sin, maybe I didn't do the same stuff or the specific things that you're going through right now, but I know that I was in need of a Savior and I have mourned and I can be there and I will be there for you because that's what meekness is. Meekness is being able to come alongside someone else, not thinking of your own issues, but the issues of others and trying to, to meet those needs of people around you. Amen? So we see that there needs to be a noticing of, of being poor and deficient in spirit of mourning before we can actually live a meek lifestyle. I read this, uh, this, this quote says, you can't truly be meek unless you've received and experienced the grace given to us by Jesus. We've talked about a couple times in this series that the first three were kind of our relationship with God and things that are going on internally with God, love, joy, and peace, and the, and the rest are kind of our relationship with man. We can't truly walk out the grace that call, God calls us to walk out in and walk out in the power unless we've experienced his love and his mercy and his grace that only comes through meekness. Because it's meekness that is able to release that power of grace, release that power of love. Because it's God's power under control. Galatians 6.1, after the fruit of the Spirit, which we've been studying in Galatians 5.22-23, it says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Gentleness and meekness can lead to others being restored. Every believer is called to the ministry of reconciliation. We're all called to be able to go out and see people saved and see people set free. But it's through that meekness. I know we think of Moses and sometimes we don't think that, that he was actually meek and that he was humble, but actually he writes this self about him. I think it's in Numbers. It says that, that Moses was the, the most humble or he was the meekest person alive. He was actually the, the person that wrote the first five books of the Bible. So he wrote that about himself. I mean, you have to be humble, right, to write that about yourself? But I mean, he had an anger problem. He had, and he needed, he needed major anger management, right? First time we see him, one of the first times we see him, as an adult, he kills someone. And then the end of his life is anger. He doesn't listen to God, and he, he's, he's not able to go into the promised land. So those are the things we think about. But actually, he was able to demonstrate meekness because he was able to stay with a million plus people possibly and keep his cool. It's like, come on, God. I mean, he just struck a rock. I mean, that's a lot of people you got to deal with. But anyways, God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts aren't our thoughts. But see that it's, it's through, it's, it's restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So that as we go out, we also have to look at ourselves when we, when we see brothers and sisters, maybe not not living the life that God has called them to live, or maybe we, we've seen someone that used to come to church and now we know that they're really not walking with God. That it's not to bring condemnation, but it's to bring love through a spirit of gentleness. Because we've got to look to ourselves and see how frail we are without God's grace and God's forgiveness, right? And see that He has loved us. Not to think better of ourselves, but to think about them because they need more grace. They need more love to be experienced. And we can be the vessel to bring that into their lives and bring reconciliation. Amen. Don't we want that for people around us? Don't we want to see people saved and set free? I mean, I love you guys, but we got to see some new faces up in here, right? Just like having birth and families, it's like there's so much joy going on. It's like when babies are born, 
anyways, side note. So first, he invites us to go near. Next, he invites us to, to learn from him. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So why does God want those he is working with to be concerned with how gentle or meek they, we think or we act or even we live? Because God has given us all power in the universe. And he wants us to be able to demonstrate that in a spirit of gentleness. He wants us to learn to be like him. Don't you, aren't you glad that God is not like us? Just think of, of, of you being God. Don't think too long. Because something happened to the devil when that happened. But how you would treat other people. I mean, even our own kids or our, our loved ones. I mean, we treat them sometimes bad. We have to ask for forgiveness, right? But aren't you thankful that God doesn't treat you that way? And he is trying to teach us his thoughts, his ways, his lifestyle in a spirit of meekness, in a spirit of gentleness, where we can actually come alongside. One of the stories I was reading as I was studying this was the woman that was caught in adultery. I mean, there's a lot you can, you can pull from this, but how Jesus was just kind of teaching in a group of people were around him. All of a sudden, these Pharisees, the, these leaders, religious leaders brought this woman and threw her on the ground in front of him. It was like, we caught her in the very act. What are you going to do about it? Testing Jesus, right? Says he bent down, was writing stuff in the ground, which, I mean, you could go wherever you want on that. And he kind of just pretended like he didn't, it, it seemed like he wasn't listening. Finally, they kind of repeated it. And then he finally stood up and said, those who are without sin, cast the first stone. And it says, from the oldest to the youngest, then they left. And then he went to her and he says, where are your accusers? And she's like, there's no one around anymore. He's like, go and sin no more. He's like, neither do I accuse you, but go and sin no more. He didn't condone her sin, just like we're not supposed to condone people's sins. But are we there to bring restoration? Are we there to bring healing into that person's life? Or are we there to kind of nitpick at them? And say, come on, you're not doing that right. And put more weights on them. And put more burdens on them like the Pharisees did. Or are we truly a church, a, a, a body of believers and disciples of Christ that can come alongside someone and bear one another's burden just like Christ is bearing our burdens and has bore our burdens upon the cross. We must be fit to learn from him. Empty vessels cannot be filled, but those who are already filled with themselves and the things of this world have no room for the Spirit to fill them up. The Spirit we know is a gentleman, it's, 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 it's in some doctrines, he's a gentleman it's called, and he won't force himself upon anyone. But if you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness sake, then it says that he will be filled, that you will be filled. Are we emptying of ourselves of ourselves? To receive his grace. It says in the Bible that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Are we coming in humility to the master to be tamed, to be broken so that he can use us for his good work? To be able to demonstrate his power in this generation? Or are we causing resistance because we're still doing our own thing, going our own way? Freedom isn't so that I can do whatever I want. Freedom is so that you can do the right thing. It's the power to do the right thing. Are we giving place for the Holy Spirit to move and to work and to change us? We mentioned earlier that meekness is power under control. And one of the illustrations uses is the taming of a wild animal. And I know many people know, but, but a yoke was something that was either placed on one ox or a team of oxen. And it either pulled a plow or some type of implement behind them to till up the ground. And usually when they trained a younger ox, they put it under a, a yoke with another older ox. And as, as they pulled, that young ox might go to the left or to the right or go too fast or go too slow. But that older ox actually helped in the training process. And that is what God, that's what Jesus is calling his disciples, is to come close to him and be placed underneath that yoke so he can teach us and that he can, and, and we can learn from him to walk gently, to walk lowly. So that we can truly use that power. I mean, oxes are powerful beasts. They are powerful animals, right? And they are used for so much. Pulling up trees, 
doing so much agriculturally. They've been used for, for hundreds of years. One thing as I've been studying just on, on the goodness of God, kind of as a side note is, as we went through goodness a couple, a couple weeks ago in the fruits of the Spirit, that actually in, in uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd psalm, that at one time he says, your goodness and your mercy follow me all the days of my life. As we come under that yoke, goodness follows. Because what happens when, when you actually take care of your sheep? What actually happens when you take care of your animals? That it actually is useful. It actually produces, it produces fruit. It produces fruit from the ground that was dirt and clay. But as an ox pulls, it's actually able to till it up and be able to be useful for planting. So if you look back, you can go back today and look at, my, look at your own lifestyle and think, is there goodness following me? Am I leaving dry ground behind me? Or am I leaving fruitness? Because if I am truly walking in God's fruits, in his fruit of the spirit, then I'm going to be leaving behind me life. That I'm going to be leaving tilled soil for others to reap. I'm going to be able to leave goodness behind me in other people's lives. Am I draining those around me or am I bringing life into other people's lives around us? And that is what takes place when we come under the same yoke, that that goodness and mercy will follow you. It's going to be demonstrated in our lifestyles, in our actions, and people when they leave, when they come into contact with us and leave, and we may not even know, but that there's mercy left in their life, that someone showed them mercy, that someone showed them goodness, and it could change the whole aspect on who Christ is. So are we allowing God's spirit to infiltrate the gardens of our lives where true seeds of righteousness can be planted so that we can be able to be used for his good work and his good pleasure and change the culture and the atmosphere of this community and even beyond and see his goodness reign. So we see that Jesus is inviting us to come under the same yoke so he can teach us. The Bible says that for in him all things were created when you want to know the full purpose and potential for something, you go to the creator. But it's when someone doesn't know the use or the intent of an object that we, we find misuse and we find abuse and we find destruction. Just like with individuals, with, with, with other people in relationships. We see so much abuse going on, especially in our, in our culture, in our community. Because they don't know the true intent what that person was created for. And that can even take place in our own lives because we really don't know what we're created for. And we can only know what we're created for when we go to the creator. Because when we don't come in contact with the creator, when we're not studying the word to see who God called me and made me, he made me in his image. But if we don't know that there's gonna be misuse and abuse to this body and to this life and to others around us, and it's gonna cause destruction. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, to kill and destroy. But God has come to bring life and life more abundantly. It's an insecure person that causes destruction. Either to themselves or others around them. Either an insecure person looks at themselves and is kind of just an introvert and, and you know, oh, well, I'll just let anybody do what they want to me. Or, and cause destruction that way. Or they will be the ones causing the destruction and try and put a front up because they're insecure. But it's a person that is secure in who they are and who God created them to be that will be able to bring life and walk in that love and walk in that forgiveness and walk in that grace and be able to speak it into the atmosphere where others will experience the grace and the love and power of God. Have you found that security in God yet? Can you be able to hold your head high, not in a proud, arrogant way, but knowing that God is for me, and if God is for me, who can be against me? And I can be used for his good pleasure, not misusing a spouse or misusing children or misusing a loved one or misusing the, the system of this world or, or misusing and abusing other things around us, but that I know that God has called me with a purpose. Therefore, I know that those people around me, God has called with a purpose also, and I will come alongside them and I think it's Galatians 6, 2, which I don't have it, but it says, let me just turn to it so I don't misquote it. So 
So we've already read, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you are a spirit to restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That we're to come alongside people and help in the restoration process, to bear one another's burdens. But we're not to take everything from them because further on it says, that each one of us should bear our own load. So there's burdens and there's loads. That there's, there's things in our own lives that we need to take on, but it's not a burden. A burden is something that you cannot bear by yourself. Are we able to, to create a culture in this church to be able to, to bear one another's burdens, the things that are weighing them down, that they, can't, that they can't just go on anymore in life because God has called us to be able to be just like him. Strength under control is a trait of a spirit-filled believer who is secure in who God created and called them to be and knows they have been forgiven. When you're secure in who God called you to be and you're secure in a relationship as you've come to him and you're taking on that yoke, when you know you've been forgiven, you know that others can be forgiven as well. No matter what, no matter the hurt or pain they've caused you or other loved ones or other people around you, you know that God's love is potent enough to bring forgiveness into their life as much as he is to bring it into yours. And it allows us to be able to walk in a new way and walk with a new mindset and to be able to perceive God in a new way and even our own lives in a new way. Where we would be able to demonstrate power under control. We'd be able to demonstrate that love, power of love in our culture that is so needed right now you talk about gentleness, you talk about meekness, look around at what's going on right now. There's so much division, there's so much divisiveness, there's so much backbiting and murmuring and complaining that's taking place. Even in our election, I, I mean, we all know. I mean, you get on the news, it's like you have to turn it off. Just because there's so much divisiveness, there's so much backbiting going on. Because look at me, look at me, and look what they've done. Look at me, how good I am, and look what they've done. That's what our world is turning into. But it's a different culture that God is calling us to live. Amen? Don't let the culture of this world infiltrate the culture of your lifestyle and of your family. Because it brings destruction. We see what's going on in the world around us. It's causing destruction. I remember one of the, was it John F. Kennedy or someone before him? Don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Same, same, I mean, that's like a biblical principle. Are we coming to church just looking what I can get or what I can give to others? Because this lifestyle, this Christian walk is not about getting, but it's about giving. And if you want to live, you got to die. And that's what God is calling us to. I think it was Daryl was telling me last night, he was hearing some preacher talk about it. There's two people that want to kill you. The devil in God, but they're in different ways. He wants you to die to self so that he can truly use you because God can't use an individual. He can't use a person unless they're broken and depleted and deficient of self so that he can fill you to overflowing with his spirit and potency and purpose to be able to use to change the culture around you, change your family, change the atmosphere that you're living in, the chaos that's going on around you. I have here that freedom or liberty is not doing as we please. It's having the ability to do what is right. Real freedom is given to those who are meek and humble. It's actually pride that restricts, restrains, and leads to smallness and division. So there needs to be a change in masters. The mat one master is all about self, and the other master is all about selflessness. And it leads to true freedom, a pathway of freedom. And when you come under the lordship, the, the hand, the taming of Jesus Christ, there's actually more room to live because it's the abundant life that he calls us to live. That when we walk in our own, in our own ways, in our own selfish behaviors and mindset, that there's actually a restriction. There's more snares that come and hold us back from being released to the true purpose that God has for us and true potential that he wants for us. 
Because when you walk in selflessness, those things aren't going to come against you any longer. Because you're not thinking about yourself. One of the terms, one of the descriptions of meekness is, is not worrying or caring about your own honor, but you're more worried about the honor of God and the honor of those around you than you are of yourself. Are we more worried about what people say about us or about our God? Are we able to stand up for what is right? Another, another, uh, another quote, and there are so many different quotes and different uh, descriptions in the, in the Hebrew and in the Greek. One of them for, for meekness, praates, was a gentle breathe, breeze and a soothing wind or a soothing ointment. A gentle breeze and a soothing ointment. I don't know if you've ever been in the wilderness, you've been in a desert, you've been in a dry, hot, stagnant place, and when a gentle breeze comes in, it's like a fresh of breath air. Are we living a life when we come to someone else's wilderness, into their desert, into their chaos, are we like a a breath of fresh air that we bring a breeze into the atmosphere? Are we able to be used to bring that soothing ointment where they're able to have a moment where they're not have to think about the pain and chaos and difficulty that they're going through. That's a life of meekness that God is calling us to. And that is a fruit that only can be, can be worked up and come to cultivate and be produced by the Spirit of God. Amen? Finally, he promises rest for our souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. A life of meekness and gentleness leads to a life of rest on the inside because it's knowing that he is present in your life no matter the circumstances that come and the issues you face. It's knowing that the master is always present. When we come to him, when we take his yoke upon us, there's that security that comes And there's a security in knowing in our very soul we can find rest because we know no matter what's going on, no matter what the chaos, no matter what type of storm, excuse me, or hardship may come, we know that he is in the midst and he's present. Amen? That that is finding true rest. It's not knowing that I have, you know, I have... I have a steady job, I have a house payment, I have a family with two and a half kids, a dog, a cat, a car, and a truck, but it's knowing that I am secure in God's arm. I'm secure in his presence, and I know that he's going to be with me no matter what, whether it's a a season of fatness or whether it's a season of leanness, that God is going to be present and in our midst. It's knowing that he is with us, and he is present in our life. It's having that perseverance inside of us, knowing that he is present and that he will be there when I call upon his name. He's going to be there when I'm going through the pain or something from my past comes up, sneaks out from nowhere, that he is going to be there for me. That the maker is there, there with open arms for to receive us, to receive us into his arms. And I can rest in his presence, knowing that I'm side by side. So often we think of this lifestyle as just weakness. A life of meekness is weakness, some people say. But God has actually called us to battle. He's called us for beauty and he's called us for power and called us for greatness. That there's greatness that's weaved within us. But it's not until we see that it's actually his image that we were created in that was used for greatness and not the sin of this world that is so sometimes prevalent in our our life. It's not till we open ourselves, it's not till we become broken. And I'm not trying to be, you know, morbid, like I've said before, in any way. That you can become so introspective and so morbid in your thinking that you just think that I'm, woe is me, I'm a sinner, and you'll never be able to produce, and you pretty much handicap yourself from living the abundant life that God calls you to. But unless there is a brokenness, unless there is coming to a place with God, that he won't be able to use us. Use us for his fullness. Use us as we get past the, just kind of what we think about ourselves, that pride, that arrogance. Look at Peter. Peter was pride, he was arrogant. He was one of the disciples that Jesus called. 
But God wasn't able to use him until he went through a brokenness where he thought he was all powerful. He had all the strength. He thought, oh, you know what? If they try and come against you, I'm going to attack them. And you're not going to the cross. You're not going to die. What do we see? We see him denying Jesus three times in front of either one girl or a couple little girls, it says. It wasn't until we actually see what we're made of that we can actually be used. Because when we actually see what we're made of, then God will be able to come and bring forgiveness and bring healing and fill us up with power. And the next time we see him in the book of Acts, he's preaching and he sees 3,000 souls saved. It's not until someone is broken that God can release us in his power and in his presence and in his grace to see people changed around us. Paul had to be thrown off his high horse, so to speak, before God could use him. Samson had to be blinded before he could actually see what God was calling him to live, the lifestyle. And it says that in his death, that more people died, more Philistines died than in his life that he lived. We might be doing all right, we might be doing good, but when we come to that place of truly dying to self, that is when more things will take place in our lives. That is when more power will be able to be released in our lives and released in this church. Are we living the life of meekness? Are we able to live in that freedom that God has called us to live in? Because when we continue to live in pride, it's actually a cage, it's actually a bondage. And the only person that can come is Jesus. That is the thing that combats meekness, is pride and worrying about self. How you see God will determine how you see yourself. As we're closing, the worship team can come up. But I just wanted to kind of leave us with this thought. How you see God will determine how you see yourself. And I, and, and I mention this maybe in some form or fashion every time I, I speak. Because I think we continually need to contemplate how we see God. Knowing that he has so many different facets. That there's so much to know about him. That we can never come to truly understand him until we're able to, to be in our glorified bodies and see him face to face. But are we trying to develop our knowledge and our revelation and our relationship of God and who he is? Because we can get stuck in the past. We can get stuck in the past things. We're able to use our past where God met us. We're able to use those altars that are spoken of in the Old Testament for times of seeing God met me here. But it's actually to propel us forward into the future. Are we getting stuck in in the times of the past where God met us and think that is all he'll ever be in my life? And that is all he could ever do. But are we using that to know that God is so good and he met me in the past and he's going to meet me right now in the present and he's going to continue to meet me in the future? How we see God and how we perceive God will affect how we live our lives. So I want to close with this, just this one question. Am I living how God made me to live? Knowing that God has his best thoughts and intentions for me and for you. Am I living the life and am I living the way that God has called me to live, to be useful for the master? Let's stand and pray this morning. There's someone that needs prayer this morning, whether it be for for a personal issue, something you're going through, or maybe this message spoke to you and you felt that you need to come forward for prayer. I would love to pray for you. I know the Spirit, he's, He's everywhere. He's within us. If we've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I know that you can deal with God on yourself, but if you feel a nudging, if you feel kind of your heart starting to beat and race right now, like I need to come forward. I want to pray for you. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit because he's able to do so much more than you're able to think or imagine or comprehend. 
Let me just pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you call us close to you. That you call us into your midst, God. That you've given us a freedom of choice and we choose you this morning. We choose to come under your lordship, under your reign, under your hand. Would you continue to teach us to know your ways and to know how you do things, to know your love more in a deeper, passionate way, to know more about forgiveness so that we can forgive others, to know more about your grace so we can extend grace to others. We thank you, God. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to make a way for us so that we can come into a right relationship with you. And I pray this morning as we go into this song that if you're speaking to someone into their heart, into their spirit, that you would do a mighty work and a mighty deed inside of them, Lord, that they would come to know you and experience you. Help us to live with your fruit, leaving goodness and mercy behind us, God. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna be going into this time of, of worship. I understand if you need to leave, we're having that, the, the harvest party today at four, but if you need prayer for anything, you can come forward. We're not gonna be doing any of the desserts because it's gonna be kind of like four o'clock is pretty soon. I know, I know Wally. We have some sugar-free stuff. But if you like look forward to that, I know this is totally changing the atmosphere. But if you actually look forward to that and, and everything, I'm sure we can find some food back there for you. Um, but we're gonna, I just ask that, that would, this would be an altar this morning. So if you do need to leave, just, just try and sneak out and, and uh, maybe kind of meet in the back or something if you wanna talk with people. But I really believe God wants to do something in someone's heart to be able to truly see themselves in a new light and no longer walk in insecurity, but walk in the secureness.